So, welcome everyone to this celebration of National Poetry Month on April 2nd. Um, we're super happy to welcome back Manuel Xavier and to welcome Lisa Gordo. Um, and uh, thanks for coming out on this beautiful Saturday when you could be outside. <laughs> um, we appreciate your coming in. So you are now in the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. Um, the Bureau is a government agency for a government that does not yet exist, which is to say this is a utopian project. We long for a different world, and we hope you do too. <laughs> um, so we are a queer bookstore. We do exhibitions of art and activist materials, and we host events like this. We're an all-volunteer organization that I founded with my partner. I am Greg Newton, and my partner is Donnie Jokum. And we have a bunch of volunteers. Today, we have Amanda Hart helping us out. And that's how we do this. Uh, that's how we make it work. So we do have a suggested donation of $10. Give what you can. I know a lot of people gave online. Thank you for that. We really appreciate it. So don't feel obligated if, if you can't swing it. Also, if money is tight and you want to buy books, you should hold on to your money and buy the books. <laughs> um, but if you haven't given and you're able to, please throw something in. Thank you. Reading. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so we're going to get started. Emmanuel's going to read first, so I'm going to read his bio, and then we'll jump right in. And hello to our audience out in cyberspace. I assume you're there, but I can't see you. Um, so, poet and activist Emmanuel Xavier was born in Brooklyn, New York, and became involved in the ball scene as a homeless gay teen. Xavier has received recognition as a spoken word artist from the national colleges and universities and from, I'm sorry, from national colleges and universities and was named as an LGBTQ icon by the Equality Forum. He has been presented a New York City Council Citation Award, received International Latino Book Award and Lambda Literary Award nominations and American Library Association over the rainbow book selections for his collections, which include Peer Queen, Americano, If Jesus Were Gay, Nefarious, and Radiance. He is the recipient of a Gay City Impact Award and the Marsha A. Gomez Cultural Heritage Award. Selected Poems of Emmanuel Xavier was a Kirkus Review Best Indie Book of 2021. And we have copies both in English and in Spanish. Uh, please welcome Emmanuel Xavier to the stage. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> thank you everybody for coming out and thank you for watching. Um, it's been a long time since I do an actual live reading event. So um, I'm really excited about this and it's great to meet you, Lisa, and I'm really excited to be your opening act. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for those of you not familiar with my work, I came out in the 80s and I was kicked out and ended up at the West Side Highway Piers where I got involved with the house scene which became popularized with a documentary called Paris is Burning and most recently with a show called Pose. So a lot of my friends whenever I watch Paris is Burning um, are, are featured in that film. And one of my closest friends was Willie Ninja. Um, and I got to read this poem to him just before he passed in the hospital. And um, it's called Legendary. It was his favorite. There are gods amongst us in these ghettos, so black, so fierce, so brown, so beautiful. Their time on earth may be as oppressive as ignorance, limited to the demons flowing in their blood. But after safely passing over back to the clouds, the wind will still carry their auras and prophecies. Their bones will still beat drums for their children to dance. The phoenix will still rise from the flames of Paris with hope and womb. 
There are gods amongst us in these ghettos, so brown, so fierce, so black, so beautiful, that if you spend too much time caught up in yourself, you just might miss him that is goddess, she that is God, they that are legends, working the runway as if walking on water, reaching the stage that promised land where peace is not ridiculed and the only war worth fighting for is protecting your child from the terrorist acts of a mainstream America. Where reading is, not a, is an act of learning, not degrading words used to disguise fragility and fractured dreams. Where shade is a shadow you walk in to avoid the light, but who wants to stay out of the warmth of the sun? If you waste your time trying to be a false prophet, robed in attitude and labels to obscure the insecurity, you may fail to recognize their divinity and miracles, parting the crowds, resurrecting from the floor, scoring tens of commandments, because trophies will not feed the hungry, coat the homeless, hide the scars. Grand prizes will not bring Lazarus or La Beja back from the dead. They will just sit in your closet, fake idols gathering dust before the gold paint chips away. You cannot sell them for freedom. You cannot trade them in for love. There are gods amongst us in these ghettos, so black, so fierce, so black, so beautiful so brown, so fierce, so brown, so beautiful. Watch them carefully and say your prayers as they enter the ballroom. Angel wing feathers decorating skin, recrafted over silicone and martyred colors. See the gods dream, see the gods give, see the gods live. They exist in the spaces where white is not the only hue that represents purity. They will not battle to your rhythms and beats, click, spin, and dip simply for amusement. They will not teach those who share their souls and names to hate. Their heartbeats are louder than the blaring speakers. You want realness? Look at your hands. Are they red from the revolution? or from the blood of your own sisters. There are gods amongst us in these ghettos, so black, so brown, so fierce, so beautiful, so bright. Look up towards the heavens and pray. Then look at yourself in the mirror and say, stars are not only found out in the sky, but in ourselves. Um, I've also done a lot of work with um, LGBTQ youth, and um, I just have to say it's really, really disappointing what is happening in Florida. Um, especially, I mean, one of the poems that I was able to share when I was brought down there to do some events is this poem, and this is one of the poems that now I won't get to share. It's called Runaway. There is a world out there where I belong, loved by a mother and father who understand my dreams, who listen to my fears of my older cousin, his touch, by how boys make fun of me in school. There's a world out there where I can grow up to love myself and others like me, where soft-spoken boys can speak boldly. I will call it poetry each memory and inspiration, all this pain, these dismembered and abandoned cars, these empty lots left behind, where I know deep in my heart that there's innocence in playing with dolls, reaching for rainbows, books, even mommy's pretty dresses. I will not be alone in this world. I have somewhere to run. I do not know exactly where. I have no maps or stars to guide me through the night. If it turns out 
that this is my world. Maybe I should simply learn to laugh and live and let the others catch up to me instead. I'm gonna lighten it up just a little bit. Um, I, I got Jenny Levingston, who did Paris is Morning to read this next poem. It's up on YouTube somewhere. It's called The Thing About My Pussy. My pussy has lots of dreams for us. There is no room for anyone else in our universe. We are atheists, but believe there will be an afterlife for us to continue this wondrous journey. My pussy is very political. When the time comes, my pussy has requested to be cremated as the thought of long, slimy worms crawling inside sounds gross. My pussy chews on my pens as I try to write. My pussy does not realize he is acting in a way inappropriate to his age. My pussy refuses to grow up. Perhaps my pussy thinks it is Halloween, but then he is black and every day is a satanic holiday. My pussy has money stored away somewhere in this apartment in a collection of thongs he wears in the summer when I am not home. I don't know where that rumor about pussy stealing your breath at night came from. My pussy's only goal is to get me to fall asleep so that we could cuddle. I have yet to find that hidden camera I know my pussy had installed to film me while having sex with men. One day, my pussy will blackmail me for some expensive Japanese dinner or these will end up on the internet. My pussy is not satisfied that I gave him a drag queen name and had his balls removed at an early age so that he wouldn't have to talk. My pussy has saved me on numerous occasions from villains that have broken into our home and attempted to murder me. He does not care that New York is not a stand your ground state. My pussy maintains his glorious physique by purposefully swallowing his own hair and does not understand his warped influence on young impressionable girls insecure about their weight. My pussy is a great host and welcomes all of our guests with such flair. He loves corduroy and contemporary pop music. My pussy is a huge fan of graffiti art and period peace movies. My pussy likes poetry and humorous short story collections, but has been known to read chick lit during the summer season. I would not put it past him to tag the neighborhood walls dressed as a character from a Jane Austen novel. My pussy is rather superstitious and hates the Pope, Republicans, Onions, Jehovah's Witnesses, Chris Brown, and anyone allergic to pussy. <laughs> How's everybody doing? <laughs> um, that was a lighter poem back to a more serious note. Um, June, um, is we commemorate um, the Pulse incident. And this poem I had written for Omar Mateen, who was actually responsible for that. We will keep on smiling from the dance floor and we will keep on smiling from the bar. And we will keep on loving without limits. And when we do, we promise you, we will not do it in fear from faiths which hate us, or concealed from spouses, only way for appearances, while living in denial. Yes, you might think it's a sin, but we promise, whatever God you pray to, his or her, but their only mistake is not those who find ecstasy in the music, truth in their gender, or love in one another, but those who slaughter, silent screams, regardless of language, especially those who murder by the dozens and attempt to harm even more. You claim not to have a problem with Black people, yet you left us all brown like you, strange fruit scattered on the dance floor. We will keep on smiling, and we will do it the same way all of God's children do, even as they keep trying to take away our rights or sending us back to other countries. This is our America too. We promise we know hatred, white supremacy, and bombings too, yet we will never forget love 
His love is love. A family can come together to heal. A beautiful smile can emerge from a photograph for years to come. Your bullets will never erase our memories. We will keep on smiling. We will keep on loving in spite of you. If Jesus were gay, if Jesus were gay, would you tattoo him to your body, hang him from your chest, pray to him and worship the son of man? Would you still praise him after dying for your sins? If it was revealed, Jesus kissed another man, but not on the cheek. Would you still beg him for forgiveness? Ask him for miracles. Hope your loved ones get to meet him in heaven. If Jesus were gay and still loved by God and Mary because he was their child after all, hailed by all angels and feared by demons, would you still long to be healed by him? Take him into your home and comfort him. Heal his wounds and break bread with him. Would wars be waged over religion? Would world leaders invoke his name for votes? Would churches everywhere rejoice and celebrate his life? Would rappers still thank him in their acceptance speeches? If the crown of thorns were placed on his head to mock him as the queen of the Jews, if he was whipped because fags are considered sadomasochistic sodomites, if he was crucified for the brotherhood of man, would you still repent? Would you pray to him when you were dying? If he didn't ask for you to be just like him, if he only wanted you to love yourself, if he asked that you not judge others, would you still wait for him to come back and save your soul? Would you deny him? Would you believe in peace? Would there still be hate? Would there still be hell? Would there be laws based on the meaning of true love? What would Jesus do? What would you do? So have three more. Um, this poem was written for my stepfather. I never actually got the opportunity to meet my real father. Um, I just recently found him, although we haven't spoken. But um, my stepfather and I had quite a volatile relationship, but through the years we made peace with one another. And uh, you know, um, this was written for him. It's it's all about forgiveness. And you know, he forgets that he used to call me mariconcito, that I harbored years of hatred toward him while hoping to find my real father. My childhood memories of him reminding him, reminding me I was my mother's son, not his. I tried to poison him once and scattered sharp nails inside the shoes in his closet. By the time one of his sons died of AIDS, I was already lost in contempt for the man I blamed for everything. There was a time I was in love and he met my boyfriend. Now he forgets to go to the bathroom where he is. I help him walk slowly outdoors to step outside the prison cell that is the tiny apartment with no windows in which I grew up abused by both of them. He barely understands. His fate has been torture. I know that I cannot be his savior. I used to pray for him to die, but here he is slowly fading. In his eyes, I see that he learned to love me and wishes he could take it all back. He is unable to recall those drunken nights and hateful words. I should do the same. I left a long time ago, but he still remains haunted by the little boy who wanted to belong. Like him, I want to forget we made mistakes and caused so much pain. I need for both of us to remember how he taught me how to ride a bike and how to swim and told me better late than never that he loved me and was proud of all I had done. I have to help him settle into his favorite chair and let him know that I forgive him. 
there is a place somewhere where he will call me Iho, and I will know him as my dad. I grew up in New York and I started in slam spoken word poetry and um, I started out the New York and Poets Cafe and um, this is one of the first poems. Actually, um, my first poetry collection, Peer Queen, which they have available here, came out in 1997. It was self-published. And um, so when I first started, many of my poems were written in Spanglish which was Spanish and English, and this poem encapsulates all of that. It's called Nueva York. While Mexicans shine the sole of the white men's shoes, Ricans and Dominicans drive around with black-faced virgins and saints on their dashboards, blasting rap and freestyle down the streets where mountain campesinos fall in love with South American cholas, getting cruised by the homeless men, loose change jingling in their pockets, and all the Latinos freezing their nalgas off, screaming, me cago en Dios! Reminiscing about homelands where tropical trees and twilights wore on their souls and the sun brings out natural skin tones. Papito vendiendo coquitos mientras brown skin project mothers cross themselves every morning before heading out to the factories or going out to do the compras so that the children won't have to eat pan con welfare cheese again. 16 year old Angie popping her gum, hands on her cintura screaming. Yo, Miriam, throw down the baby. I mean, I don't want to go up the stairs. I'm too tired. Just throw the baby out the window. I'll catch it, I swear. The gringos watching curiously, unable to understand the slang bodega terms, the New Yorican words that give the spice of life and ritmo y el sabor to la isla del encanto, la isla de Nueva York. And I'm going to close out with um, one of my signature pieces, <laughs> um, which I've read plenty of times. And I wrote, I think it first was published back in 2002, and somehow it's still relevant. It's called Americano. And thank you to the great audience. <laughs> and thank you, everybody who's watching. I look at myself in the mirror, trying to figure out what makes me an American. I see Ecuador and Puerto Rico. I see brujo spirits moving across the backs of santeros, splattered with the red blood of sacrificed chickens on their virgin white clothes and blue beads for Yemaya, practicing religions without a roof. I see my own blood reddening the white sheets of a stranger proud American blue jean labels on the side of the bed. I see Don Rosario and his guayabera sitting outside the bodega with his Puerto Rican flag reading time in the eyes of alley cats. I see my mother trying to be more like Marilyn Monroe than Julia de Burgos. I see myself trying to be more like James Dean than Federico Garcia Lorca. I see Carlos Santana, Gloria Stefan, Ricky Martin, Jennifer Lopez, more than just sporadic Latin explosions, more like fireworks on a Cuatro de Julio, as American as Bruce Springsteen, Janis Joplin, Elvis Presley, and Aretha Franklin. I see Taco Bells and chicken fajitas at McDonald's. I see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. I see Cheetah Rivera on Broadway. You see, I am as American as lemon merengue pie, as American as Wonder Woman's panties, as American as Madonna's bra, as American as the Quinteñeros, the Abduls, the Lees, the Jacksons, the Kennedys, mostly all of us immigrants to the soil, since none sound American Indian to me.
As American as television snow after the anthem is played, and I am not ashamed. Jose, can you see? I pledge allegiance to this country, tis of me, land of dreams and opportunity, land of proud detergent names and commercialism, land of corporations. If I can win gold medals at the Olympics, if I can sign my life away to die for the United States, ain't no small town ain't gonna tell me I ain't an American because I can speak in two languages. Coño carajo, fuck you. This is my country too, where those who do not believe in freedom and diversity are the ones who need to get the hell out. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, man. So good to hear you again. Glad to have you back here. Um, oh, before I forget, I also want to thank Michelle Carlsberg, who helped to organize this event. So, Michelle, if you're home watching this, we love you. Thanks for all you do. So, Lisa Dordal holds a Master of Divinity and a Master of Fine Arts, both from Vanderbilt University, and teaches in the English department at Vanderbilt. She is the author of Mosaic of the Dark, which was a finalist for the 2019 Audrey Lorde Award for Lesbian Poetry and Water Lessons. She is a Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net nominee and the recipient of an Academy of American Poets University Prize, the Robert Watson Poetry Prize and the Betty Gay Hart Poetry Prize. Her poetry has appeared in Narrative, Image, Rhino, The Sun, The New Ohio Review, Best New Poets, Greensboro Review, Ninth Letter, and Kalex. Please welcome Lisa Gray. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm delighted to be here and sharing the stage with Manny. Um, and I was also going to thank Michelle Carlsberg for organizing this and the Bureau for hosting it. Um, and I'm super excited about being here to read from my new book, which was just officially released yesterday. Um, so <laughs> just to give you a little kind of background of the book, there's a lot of poems in here about my mother's alcoholism and eventual death and my father's deepening dementia, and then my own childlessness. Um, and then against the backdrop of those personal griefs, there's a lot in here about um, kind of me examining the patriarchal underpinnings of the world that I grew up in, and also poems about my complicity in systemic racism as a, as a white girl growing up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, so I'm going to start with the first poem of the book and end with the last one, and then I'll read a bunch in between. Um, the first poem is very appropriately called Welcome. Um, and the, the inspiration for this poem, I, I wrote this poem in 2017 when I was attending the AWP conference, which I know some of you know, but it's a huge writing conference, 10,000 people. I always get completely overwhelmed but I love the conference. I go to every panel I can during the day. And then in the evening, I go back to the hotel and just channel surf on the TV. And yeah. so this was in DC, 2017. I was staying at a hotel that had one of those welcome channels. So every time you land on it, there's someone telling you about the hotel amenities. And um, I just started to get kind of freaked out about this woman on the welcome channel. And I started writing down <laughs> she was saying and I sort of in the evenings I talked to my wife and I'd say yeah I'm getting kind of freaked out and then um I wrote this poem on the way home and I showed it to her when I got home and she looked up at me and said I didn't know you were getting that freaked out <laughs> <laughs> welcome flipping the remote I keep landing on the hotel's welcome channel hello a woman says White woman, pretty smile. May I have a minute of your time? Be as alert as you are at home, she says. Pretty woman, concerned for my safety. She keeps walking towards me, 
there behind everything else, like fear behind the eyes. I keep flipping, taking in the news of the week. People are protesting in the streets. This pussy fights back, no ban, no wall. Never invite strangers into your room. Pretty smile, pretty woman, as pretty as my mother was when she was alive, pretty as she was in my dream. Be alert, the woman says, as alert as you are at home. I never knew on Tuesdays what she looked like. My mother, who drove to the Del Mar College of Hair Design to get dolled up cheap by a stranger, sometimes large loopy curls, other times tight and small, tucked in like something sleeping. Use the viewport, the woman says, if someone knocks on your door. Hepburn chestnut one week to a sassy blonde the next. In the dream, she is reading from my book. She looks happy. Keep the doors and windows locked, the woman says. In five pages, my mother will be dead. First, the bottles hidden in bookcases throughout the house. Then the heart wing, locked, the woman says, at all times. My mother glances up. She is reading in the voice she used for Sounder and the Chronicles of Narnia. She reads as if the woman she is will not die, as if the woman who dies will not be her. As if she is not even there. Like when she learned about my attempts, aspirin, then the knife, my hand like Abraham's over Isaac, Nice story, my mother said. We had learned to slip out of ourselves, to squeeze our consciousness through a hole the size of a dime. We were small inside our bodies. My body is sin, she told me once. Be alert, the woman says, as alert as you are at home. Nice story, she said. So this next one is called Ars Poetica, which uh, just means the art of poetry. And it's um, Ars Poetica poems often give an idea um, to the reader why the poet is writing, what their kind of impulses are. Ars Poetica. My mother is saying something I still can't hear and I want to believe there is a door. Sometimes I dream I am being led through darkness and I wouldn't call her death natural. So many rooms were closed off before we knew they were there and I was the one no one believed. And my father still insists her liver was fine. It was her heart, he says, just her heart. Uh, and this next one is called grief. There's a lot in here about my mother. It's my obsession. <laughs> the first book is also about my mother. There will be days when the word mother will burst out of you like the black smoke of a squid, a fire deep inside water. Anyone can become animal or a flicker of light. Remember, infinity means unfinished and time doesn't move at the same speed for everyone. Remember, mother contains not just the sea, but the darkness of the sea, and there is no such thing as a half-life for grief. Even oceans contain waterfalls, and your mother is inside everything that you write, sometimes as melody, sometimes as mountain or bone. Every time you hear the word, you become something else. Uh, one more mother poem. This is called My Mother is a Peaceful Ghost. In my dreams, my mother keeps walking out of the kitchen singing, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. She never sings past the first verse. Last night, I dreamed I was back at the house, every light on when I arrived. My mother, forgetting she was dead, smiled, said she was fine, everything was fine. At family gatherings, weddings, baptisms, my mother would look around sort of stunned and say, there's so many of you. As if 
we'd arrived from someplace other than her own body, a country foreign to her. My mother is no longer flesh or breath. She's not a thing anymore. Is she with God? Some days I believe, some days I don't. Centuries ago in a church in Europe, someone carved God help us into a pew plague years. Sometimes my God is so big, I wonder what's the use, divinity diluted into nothingness. My mother tried to stop drinking. I stopped, she told me once, like you'd stop a dryer or a washing machine. We were standing in the Blackwater Falls gift shop, looking at coffee mugs printed with maps. West Virginia on one side, waterfalls on the other. One mug had a gold star to mark the visitor center. You are here, it said, on a travel mug. Here and not here. How do you name what isn't here? She tried to stop and didn't. And the inspiration for this next poem came from a, a story I heard on NPR while I was driving, doing errands. Um, it's actually an interview. I don't remember who was being interviewed, but he was a black scholar. Um, and in the course of this interview, he sort of parenthetically mentioned the Pippi Longstocking books, which I grew up reading. And he um, talked about how racist they were. And I was completely floored. I thought, what? Um, but I knew I had to listen to him. You know, this was, I was, this was maybe three or four years ago. And I was in the process of really trying to understand more deeply how white supremacist ideology works. Um, I grew up in a fairly uh, liberal, politically liberal family um, in a sort of integrated, diverse neighborhood. Um, and I probably knew something about systemic or structural racism um, from high school on, but I thought of it in terms of something that was more contained, you know, within particular institutions, here is racism or particular um, structures. It wasn't until the last probably five or six years that I really caught on, on to how deeply um, white supremacist ideology infiltrates everything. So um, I got home, I still have a Pippi Longstocking book and I read it and I was horrified, absolutely horrified. Um, it's called Primer. You're a white girl, cute in the eyes, reading your first chapter book. Maybe it's summer and you're sitting on the porch steps painted red every year by your mother. Maybe the sky is blue and the elm trees don't have Dutch elm disease, which means you haven't grieved yet for a tree. Maybe this is the day your father will set up the swimming pool with its thick plastic floor and round corrugated wall. Maybe soon you'll feel the pieces of dark mulch poking up from beneath the plastic. Maybe you loved the bumpiness of the pool floor because you knew how to float above it. It wasn't a big pool, but you were small. Your body fit everywhere. Under porches, when you played 12 o'clock, the witch comes out, or inside the house, cupboards, sideboards. Maybe this is the day you're reading Pippi Longstocking, the year you loved Pippi best. Her house by the sea, her horse, her strength, the ease with which she traveled the world. Maybe you're already thinking about Halloween, painting your face with freckles, putting hangers in your hair to make your braids stick out. Maybe you didn't think anything about the barbarians in the Congo, didn't understand the part about Pippi's father being king of the Negroes. Maybe you saw the picture of Pippi with her face painted black, and turned the page the way you turned any page. White girl inside the white imagination, the horse, the tiny house, the beautiful ocean, before you knew an ocean could be anything but beautiful. Um, so about, I guess it's 15, 17 years ago, my wife and I experienced a failed adoption, um, and we never really 
got back on the horse or whatever the expression is. Um, so there's, a, there's also poems in here about not having children and that, um, that, that, that whole from that experience. Um, so I'm gonna read two poems related to that. Broken arm. Like you hold a baby, the nurse said, hold your arm like you hold a baby. And I held it that way. My fingers fat with pain I couldn't feel as I breathed come back onto my suddenly strange skin like you hold a baby. We had a son once for a week calling him Ben, a name the birth mother loved and we loved the way she said his name until she changed her mind and the future became a house we weren't permitted to enter and the future became a great homesickness which is how some traditions refer to the divine, which is to say everywhere and nowhere, like salt dissolved in water. And now there is a boy with a voice we can't hear and a boy with a voice we can't unhear. A boy who might love darkness, might love searching for constellations, new ones that he can name. A boy who makes dinosaurs from blue clay, each one with three hearts. You can't see them, but they're there. Ben, the birth mother said, like you hold a baby, the nurse said, like a great homesickness that might be God or might be grief. This one's called Daughter Poem. Sometimes I see her pressing her palms against a window pane in a house that is real, the way a house in a dream is real until you start to describe it. And all you can say is, it was this house, only it wasn't. It's winter and she likes to feel the cold entering her body or it's summer and it's heat she's after. She wasn't born, so she can't die. Sometimes there is a window, but no girl, and I am the one walking towards it. Sometimes I see her peering in, forehead against the screen of our back door, or running ahead of me on a path that is real, the way a path in a dream is real, saying, this way, this way. And then uh, this word is called, I mean, this bird, this poem is called um, New Bird. <laughs> There's a new bird at the feeder. My stepmother notices its size, smaller, she says, than a vireo or a chickadee. My sister sees white on the wing. I notice its beak slender like a warbler's. I open Peterson's field guide to birds, and then, because it's November, turn to confusing fall warblers. Four entire pages as if confusion were its own species. My father is with us eating cinnamon crunch. He's a child, again, dementia, changing his mind daily. He's sweeter now, milder than I've ever seen him. His own father, died when he was 16, Thanksgiving Day, 1943, sudden sickness of the heart, the paper said, above the outlook for feed supplies and cattle costs. The only time I've seen my father cry was during the sound of music, when Captain Von Trapp uses an army whistle to summon his children. My father and stepmother own seven bird books, paperback, hardback, one signed by Peterson, another inscribed by my brother in 79, Dear Mom, Merry Christmas. My stepmother at 92 says, please take one. My father, also 92, says, buy your own book. <laughs> His way of saying he's not dead yet. He doesn't know he has dementia. We watch TV together. He loves the commercials. In one, a turkey drives a golf, court, golf cart, relaxes at the beach, reads a magazine, gone cold turkey, the voice says. And the turkey does a dance, kicking its feet in the air. A drug has curbed the turkey's cravings for cigarettes. My father thinks the turkey is real. You can tell by the eyes, he says. 
During a commercial about Alzheimer's, he doesn't say a word. The bird at the feeder is real. We can tell by its hunger, its flight. My father keeps eating his cereal. My sister takes a picture of the bird, clicking as quickly as she can, but the bird is faster and the picture is a confusion of wings, a blur which could be its own thing. There's a story about God being bored when God's companions suggest a game of hide and seek. They learn how good God is at hiding. My father is different now. Is he more himself or less? I like him this way. I like the bird at the feeder, its confusion of flight and hunger. I like the turkey driving a golf cart, kicking its feet up. My father was as afraid of his own father as I was of mine. I want to believe in love. I want to believe there is more love somewhere. So I think I'll just, I'll read two more. This is another um, poem about my father. Um, his dementia has really just manifested in the last um, probably four years. He's 95 now, or will be 95. Um, and as I was trying to learn more about dementia, I went to, um, I paid a visit at, at a dementia bus, which if you don't know, it's, it's this actual bus that you enter and then you can um, learn about the experience of having dementia, like they put weird glasses on you, and um, it's it was it's very unsettling. Uh, so this is called dementia bus. The glasses they give me darken my vision, blur it into shapes I can't immediately recognize. I'm supposed to set the table for breakfast, write a check for the electric bill, put on the brown jacket, not the blue jacket and sort the shirts in the laundry basket, long sleeved from short. Every noun preceded by the, as if I live here, comfortably surrounded by my life's possessions. I'm wearing oversized gloves to mimic arthritis, spiky insoles for neuropathy. I hear voices simultaneously loud and muffled through headphones that press heavily against my ears a few times laughter that stops too suddenly, and a siren so loud I jump, uttering, get me out of here, to myself, I think, except there's a woman in the corner watching me, she's taking notes, she's too quiet. When I leave wearing the blue jacket, not the brown jacket, she gives me her notes, in which my failures are recorded along with my words. My father keeps merging houses, first wife and second. He knows me, he doesn't know me. Sometimes he looks into my face as if he's looking into a room darkened by night. When he was a boy, he had to walk all the way through his bedroom to reach the room's only light switch. I don't know if it's fear he feels now. He thinks the house he lives in has two piano rooms. And when I visit, he sees birds in the windows of my car. I see leaves reflected and branches, not birds. Don't you see them, he asks. I'm not supposed to disagree, don't you? Sometimes he gives me clues from the crossword puzzle. Here's one for you, he says. Part of LGBT, three letters starting with G. He's proud I came out. Some days he thinks he's on a ship. Some days he thinks he has patients to see, meetings to attend. Some days he sees birds in the windows of my car. When I drive back home, I take the birds with me. So I'm going to close with the last poem in the book. Um, it's called, I Love. I love how my wife says operators are standing by whenever I'm out of town and she wants to chat. I love that birds can see stars and that even fruit flies need sleep. I love that an African gray parrot learned how to use 100 words and that his last words were, be good and I love you. 
I love how Jesus stopped a crowd of men from stoning a woman just by writing in the sailor. I love that an octopus has three hearts. I love that Mother Teresa only heard from God one time and it was enough. I love that some birds mate for life and that after one dies, the survivor sings both parts of their song. I love that our brains are mostly water. I love that some people believe in heaven and some don't. I love that an owl visited my wife in a dream and that my wife said hello and asked, are you the kind of owl that people refer to as a barred owl? <laughs> I love that what saves one person is not the same as what saves someone else. I love how the word cranium sounds like the name of a flower. I love that my mother keeps wanting to show me her garden. I love that the owl answered back. Thank you all. Uh -huh. Thank you, Manny. Please hang out. Don't worry about the chairs. We'll get those eventually. Um, and we have books by Lisa and Manny at the counter and many others. Thank you so much.